So I started experimenting with Sententia with this idea of having the gameplay dictate the story. So the gameplay mechanics, I wanted to have some type of meaning or can, you know be metaphorical or have some type of meaning for what you're doing. So as the player interacts with the, the gameplay, there's kind of the story formulating in your mind in a way. So I, I feel like I'm on the right track. But like you said, it's uh, more abstract what I'm doing now. So it's not everyone's going to get it when you do that type of thing. I well, I mean, I, I've certainly already seen that. Just it, I don't, I don't want to say it's polarizing, but I, I've definitely seen there's – I'm trying to remember. I think it was my, my old calc professor one time sat me down. He's like, there are thems that get it and thems that don't. And I thought, well, <laughs> that's why you're a math teacher. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? That uh, So is it – is the gratification of knowing that there are that there is an audience out there that there are people who get what you're doing and you're like yes my my these are my people or is it more <laughs> frustrating that more gamers can't detach enough to see something you know you know what I'm saying is it, is it are you going to be happy being niche rather than necessarily you know, potentially triple A you know what I mean yeah I mean I'm yeah, it's a tough thing to answer because, um, like, I want to communicate with people, and I, I don't, like, want to be this person that's just, like, trying to alienate people and weird people out and all that. Um, right. Because I, I feel like why I do this is because I want to, like, communicate with people and, you know, affect people's lives in some way with what I'm doing. But at the same time, like, my stuff is – my last two games have been extremely polarizing. Well, Sententia, actually, I feel like my biggest mistake was that game – was um, kind of the presentation of it because it was kind of a game about like empathy and so on. But mm-hmm. in the process of doing that, like it was frustrating to people because like you know it was about like unfair situations and so on. Right. Um, and that's like a big no no in traditional like game design <laughs> thinking. You know True. what I mean? So like I feel like I frustrated so many people with the game, and it's like I, I kind of like look back and it's like man. Because at the same time, I saw a small group of people really latch on and, like, get Sententia and write, like, really long posts about it and stuff. But at the same time, (laughs) I thought, okay, I want to try and have the hook be accessible from this traditional point, but still kind of have all this storytelling stuff go on underneath it. That was my goal with Pillar. Um, And I actually, (laughs) I thought I pulled that off, but, like, if you look at the reviews, like, this has been my most polarizing thing to date. Like, there's... (laughs) If you look at the Metacritic, like literally, I think it's like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean, and like, yeah. So I've been reading the reviews, and there's people like, man, this is um, like the brightest indie game that's been out in a long time, and we need more things like this. And I read other people are just like, this game fails on so many levels. So, <laughs> you know, what I mean, I don't know. Maybe this is like my destiny to like be this polarizing person, but I don't want to be. So I'm, I'm gonna keep like trying to, you know do the best I can to be accessible but not like compromise what I'm doing because I feel like I'm on the right path personally but well so that's that's the important thing that that you, that you know that you keep saying that that this is you know again it might not be for everybody but you're not going to compromise what you're doing and as long as you you can you know be happy in that space cuz that that's a tough space to inhabit too yeah yeah I mean it is and especially cuz now cuz in college when I was doing Sententia um like Money was on my mind, I guess you could say, because I was about to graduate, and it's like, well, what am I going to do for, right? Um, you know, and that's actually another reason, it wasn't the main reason, but another reason why I cut back to two of us is because I pretty much knew that if I had a, a team of people, like, none of us would be taking any of the money, right? Like, yeah, I mean, you right. know what I mean? Like, there'd be hardly no money for anybody, so... Right, right. Um, that was on my mind for a little while, and now I just, like, we're in this weird time where I think there's actually an audience for this stuff. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, so like I think I've lucked out in that way because um, if you look at games like Dear Esther, which mm-hmm. amazingly that game sold like really well, <laughs> it's so it's also pretty experimental and crazy. But people and not everyone liked it, right? I guess that was also kind of a polarizing game. Exactly. I mean, but they did they did well enough to make another game. So mm-hmm. yeah, so we're in a cool time I think for games. So. Why? Why do you think? I mean, you're you're an industry veteran at this point. I mean, this is one, four, fifth, fourth game, fourth game. Uh, if my fourth, I mean, technically it's my eighth game, but it's my fourth, like it's published, published, yeah, right. Uh-huh. So, the, why why do you think that games haven't evolved past the, like you were saying, smashing zo- uh, goblins in the face a, a, as you level up? That they're it's not a reluctance, but why? Why do you? Th- what do you think holds games back? I think a lot of it has to do with um, 
kind of the origins of the industry, I think, um, because it, it started off very businessy oriented, right? Like oh, there wasn't right. a, um, you know, there really wasn't like there, the barrier was pretty high to make games, is what I'm trying to say. Like because of the tech barrier. So, I mean, pretty much it was just the big guys, like, trying to turn a profit that started the industry, you know what I mean? And just now that we have stuff like XNA and Unity, we're starting to see more of these um, more creative, artistic games because, like, two people can make a game now, right? And I think we talked a little bit about this last time, too, but when you have, like, 100 people working on a game, there is no way, really, in my opinion, to have, like, a single vision drive the whole thing because it's so right. cloud- there's so many people, like, having a say, and not everyone's going to see life the same way. You know what I mean? Everyone has different politics and all that. So uh, I think a lot of it has to do with that. I think a lot of it also has to do with um, – I-, I think there's this kind of view that people have that games have to be fun. And I- it's-, it's tricky to talk about this because, like, it sounds like I'm trying to be a Debbie Downer and be like, I want you to, you know, <laughs> not enjoy what I do or what, because I want my stuff to be enjoyable. Um, but I think what a lot of people want is they kind of want. What I've talked to a lot of designers now that are in like the AAA industry, and they tend to think that good game design is like something you can't put down, and something that kind of you can't get away from, and it makes you jump up and down joyously, right? Um, <laughs> and I don't really want. A lot, like I disagree with the idea that games should be addicting, and that's like a good game is determined if how by how long you play it. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Because I I think um, a lot of these games, like look at World of Warcraft, right? Like another person died playing that game for so long in like some cafe, right? Like mm-hmm. there's a certain amount of discernment that I think designers lack on that type of thing. Um, I don't think they're being honest about what their games are doing to people totally. I think they're just saying, you know, if people are reporting that they're having fun and they're playing it for long periods of time and we're getting money, then it's a good game. And I don't totally agree with that, right? Um, but that, that seems to be like a really um, prevalent view in the entire industry is that's what makes a good game, I guess. And I think part of it's kind of that too. So I mean, I, I could be wrong, right? But that's just kind of how I feel about it. So, so you're, you're saying more you want people to think about the game long after they played it rather than spending more time actually playing it necessarily. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, I, I want, like, I don't want to take people's time for too long, right? Because to me, life is beautiful and you should be enjoying real life, right? And, and this goes back to another thing is I feel like a lot of games are about escapism. Um, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. getting away from the daily, you know, your daily life for a little bit. And that's, that's fine. Like there's a place for that, but like, I don't, I don't want to, you're not saying it's place. wrong. You're just saying you're not in that place. That's yeah, yeah. that's not what I'm doing. Yeah. And I think the industry needs more stuff on the other side right now. Right. I think there's too much escapism, not enough things that people can actually relate to in real life. You know what I mean? Because if you're escaping all the time and for long periods of time, I, I find that sad. Right. And I feel like that's the perception people have of this industry as a whole is that we're a bunch of, shut-ins, right, that just kind of play games and don't socialize and get out, you know what I mean? Um, and that, that's not true, right? But I think that's how people see it because games have been like that for so long. You know what I mean? And once again, I could be wrong. This is just my opinion. But <laughs> Well, and along those lines then, I mean, I, I, I completely agree that there. I mean, there, there's certainly room under the umbrella for everything, and it's exactly, great yeah. to go out in all the different directions. So with that being said, why do you think there is such a backlash against, uh, and not necessarily against you, but against some games that try to do something different, like the the, the backlash against Gone Home, was that last year, that this isn't a real, you know, quote-unquote, a core real game, and there's just <laughs> so much anger about, okay, you don't have to like it, it just that, you know, and you don't have to play it. It's, yeah. it's not wrong that it exists, and for some people, it was a beautiful, moving experience, yeah. and for other people, they were like, I could have beaten this in ten minutes. So, it, yeah. what, what do you th- where do you think that discourse went, that it's either terrible that it exists, you know, what, what's, what's going on? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I find that a lot of people in this industry are kind of techy people, right? And they don't like to talk about feelings and emotions and get all artsy like that. They they look at things in terms of systems and fairness and, and gameplay balance, like those kind of traditional ways of looking at game design. And I think some of it is people kind of rolling their eyes at these 
you know, more feely games coming out? Like, you know, what are you talking about? Because that's not in their personality to empathize with that. You know what I mean? And that's fine, right? Because, like, you know, there's different types of people in the world. And I think another part of it is I think a lot of gamers are kind of conservatives to the extreme. Um, and they don't like the idea... I think they feel like people are coming in trying to take away their toys kind of thing, right? And I and once again, this is just kind of how I feel based on like right, the oh comments yeah. I read. And I, I don't know. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not like trying to push my opinion, but that's just kind of how I am seeing Michael, it. I'm no gamer's gator. You don't have to hedge with me. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I have to be careful because I mean, I don't I, – I, yeah, it's careful. And I've tried to stay out of the Gamergate thing, right? But like once again, like that's how everyone sees this industry now because yeah. you know, I, talk, I talk to people and they're like, oh, Gamergate is like – no. Is that, is that all you know? Of, <laughs> yeah. So there's a whole world. There's a whole panoply of things out there. Let's. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so take me through. Okay. So you you've you've created Pillar now. It's out there in the world. What? Uh, you know, where does your creative process go from here? Or do you do you spend time looking through forums now? Are you are you spending time reading reviews? I remember that was something we talked about years ago that you weren't really reading them because you were kind of a little surprised by how again we we, we just mentioned it, how vicious some of the stuff could be. So do you just now? This is my art. This is what it's gonna. It's going to do what it's going to do. I am now going to create my next piece or do you still kind of have it in, in your heart as yeah but it's mine it's my baby i brought it into the world i have to watch it you know yeah i, I keep i keep struggling with this like <laughs> a whole lot um because i started off with with the iron vengeance games reading all of my press right i just couldn't like get away from it and then with sententia like i was disappointed really with and it's not because like a lot of people panned it is that their reviews weren't constructive, right? They didn't yeah. offer, like, constructive feedback. They just turned it into, like, a joke mm -hmm. and, like, trying to make funnies, you know what I mean? To, like, they were trying to establish themselves rather than talk about what they yeah. had experienced. And, yeah. and, and I just uh, – and they, they didn't even try to, like, approach the game from considering what I was trying to do, right? They reviewed yeah. it as a traditional platformer, which – wasn't really what the game was about. Like I said, it was a game about empathy and kind of twisting those traditional mechanics. But so I don't know, you know, I, I got so disappointed. I stopped reading my press because it's like, you know, if you guys aren't going to give me constructive feedback. And the thing is, like, I, I publicly I kind of regret this now. I publicly kind of came out and said, you know, I think you guys aren't, you know, I pretty much said what I just told you. And people are like, oh, you're ungrateful. And like people attacked me back, like, because, you know, we, there's this idea in the West that, you know, the customer is always right, and, you know, I shouldn't have an opinion as the creator. I should just listen to everybody or whatever, and I don't think that's totally right. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's, like, a middle ground there, um, but whatever. That's another conversation. Um, so, I, I yeah, I, I stopped reading my press um, for that reason, and I, I started reading it again with Pillar um, because I feel like shutting yourself out of what people are saying isn't healthy, but at the same time, like, obsessing over what people are saying isn't healthy either. Well, Does that make sense? <laughs> it, makes, it makes total sense. And, and yeah. it's, it's not funny. It's interesting to watch how your career has gone because you came up really at the – kind of the infancy of the, you know, the indie rebellions there. I mean, you, you yeah. were involved with, with, you know, with the, the Summer of Indies for Xbox and – you know, and you were kind of there at the at the birth of this this great indie bubble that people are putting it, and now you're kind of coming back. You know, you, you were out of the picture for a, a little while, and now you're coming back in as people are saying maybe that the bubble is is bursting. So it's kind of, you're, you're, I think you're you're into a point now where some people are starting to get that things can be different. That just because you know. Just because something has always been done a certain way, that mean, that's the only way it can be done. So, like as like you mentioned, uh, Dear Esther and I said, "Gone Home" and things, that, you know, that are kind of trying to expand what it means to do this. And I think the yeah. more and more fans are have been kind of swept along with that. Yeah, it's been interesting to see the change. Like, a lot has changed in these last like four years. <laughs> um, oh yeah, it's it's great. Like I mean. 
I guess, sorry to kind of stray, but I just was um, thinking about, I was talking to Dave Boyles yesterday. I did, I was on his podcast and okay. uh, we were talking about how back when I started, like if you were on Rock, Paper, Shotgun or any of those sites like that, your game like blew up. You know what I mean? Like you oh, yeah, had absolutely. thousands of, well, I had like a really big Rock, Paper, Shotgun feature um, last month. I had like maybe 80 demo downloads out of that. Mm-hmm. Like, and we were talking about that. It's like, man, why don't like these people don't have the same influence they did anymore, like the Kotaku's and the joysticks. And it's, it's the YouTubers that have the influence now. Well, you know that's, I mean? that's definitely part of it. And I think the other part is, again, when, when you when you guys, your, your generation there, Chris Steele, you, that, that whole group, when you guys kind of made your debuts, you were all kind of coming in together, and then the floodgates opened, and it's not even yeah. that. It, it was partially influenced. It's partially there are so many things. Even a small site like ours, I get bombarded daily with, "Hey, try our thing. Hey, try our thing." And you know, I only have so many hours in the day. I have a full time job and two kids. So yes. you know, it's yes. you know, there's only the so thing, many yeah. things. Yeah, and that's that's also what I've noticed. It's, it's a lot harder to get press coverage now as well because they're getting yeah. so many emails. And it also seems to me like they're a little um, in this. <laughs> It's a little crazy with games journalism. Like a lot of stuff's shutting down, and they don't seem to know what to cover. And Absolutely. you know what I mean? Like it, we're in this kind of weird transition phase on their side too. I feel like, um, especially the the, the the sites that are trying to generate any kind of revenue. I mean, because they they yeah. have to constantly have their finger on the pulse. You know, th- this isn't a toot my own horn kind of thing. But Luke and I have survived. Yeah, <laughs> we're not trying to do anything other than we cover what interests us. <laughs> no, I was I was thinking about that because um I've seen a lot of sites and a lot of developers like leave in this these four years. Like yeah, you, you'd be surprised. Like honestly, you guys are probably one of the very few people that interviewed me back in 2011 that are still around today. And well, developer wise too, like a lot of the uprising guys, they're all gone. Yeah. Like it's yeah, it's crazy that to still see people around. But you know what? Like this. I was thinking about this. Why I think you guys are still around is because you guys just do this for the love of doing it. Like, you guys get something out of doing this. Am I right? Like, Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like you're in to turn a profit. I think that's how, you know, a lot of people come to indie games now, like, expecting the gold mine rush, you know, to strike it rich and all this. And they get disappointed and they yeah. leave, you know. So, but the people who you know truly love it, they stick around, you know. So That's, like, that's what I, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever met Jeff Ogle. I know of him. Yeah, you know, but so yeah, and how, you know, we've talked a, a, a number of times on here too. And he's, you know, you have to be happy if you find that that niche and you can survive in it, and you you have enough money to you know to pay your bills and eat and and, and you yeah. know keep your kids happy. Then you know you're doing you're, you're that's success. It's not gonna the days <laughs> of Notch making a game and retiring a billionaire are probably. I mean, it's still going to happen for that one out of every however many billion developers. Yeah. Yeah. But there's so much stuff out there, and unfortunately, with all of the you know with all the wheat, we also you know you also had a lot of the chaff. Yeah. And so much more of it because it was, you know, a, a, like you said, you know, being put on rock paper shotgun back then was a ticket, and you know, you know being yeah. on Steam was man, we've arrived. But, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, not anymore, baby. Yeah, <laughs> that was Steam Greenlight. Yeah, and then even if, well, Greenlight, and then just with all of the sale stuff. I mean, that's that's yeah. the other part of it from a from a business perspective. I see developers coming in. I saw somebody post it the other day. I don't remember who it was on my Twitter feed, and he's like, "Oh, look at that! Three years of my life is now a dollar ninety nine on Steam." And there was such melancholy. And you know, yeah. I understand that, but un- that's just. You know, gamers have become spoiled. It's the I'm not going to pay thirty dollars for that. I'll wait. But yeah, you yeah. That's so why I, I, I want to ask you about that. Is that a concern for you? That you know, Honor and Vengeance was a buck on XBLA. Now, yeah. you know, Pillar is ten, and people are like, well, it's still a, an indie game. Well, right, but you know, the prices have to go back up. There's no way you guys can all survive with that race to the bottom. You know, yeah. mobile game price either. Yeah, and I I told I actually wrote a blog post, the last PS blog post I did. I just kind of told people honestly. I was like, I worked on this for like over two years, and I know you guys want like this cheap price, but I, I have to if I want to keep doing this or have any chance of like yeah. doing this full time, I have to charge something that's like going to sustain me. And like one dollar games, that's just not going to do it anymore for for me, right? I you know what I mean? Like, I, so it's actually uh, eight dollars on PS4. Right. Um, and people seem like the feedback's been good. Actually, they're like, "Oh, that's that's just the right spot mm-hmm. for a PS4 uh, like premium game or whatever." So, 
I feel good with the price, but I also know I also know that people are waiting for that sale. I, I, I just know it. I think the majority of my sales will come when that happens, which I, is very unfortunate, but you know, well, that's just how it is. So. I personally think we're going to reach a day. I mean, Valve isn't going to do it anytime soon, but I think someday we're going to reach a point where Steam isn't going to do the massive everything goes on 90% sale. Just, yeah, yeah. I mean, for them, they make money either way, but I, I just, it, it's not going to be – it's clearly not sustainable. Yeah. And, you know, but, but unfortunately, we're so conditioned – that when we see something that has any kind of price point over, you know, fifteen, you start to think, well, that better be really damn fifteen dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, it's, but I mean, there, there still need to be standards. I mean, it's it's so tough because you think, yeah. well, would I spend fifty dollars to go to a movie that was terrible? Well, no. So it, it's that whole. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It's such a strange. It, it's strange for me to cover it. I can't imagine what it's like to live it. It's a strange space, like I said, to to be in. So. What what are you planning next? I mean, you, you, you took the game to GDC. I mean, so what, what what kind of what's what's next for Michael Arts? I've actually started on another game. Um, I don't want to talk about it just yet because it's sure. really early. Um, sure. But I have some kind of overarching goals for it. Um, I want it to be so with Pillar um, and with Sententi as well. There's a whole lot of time I spent like making sure every little interaction has some type of meaning to it. Um, and like I said, that kind of constrained me to yeah. a certain degree with the um, forefront gameplay. What I want to do this time is actually um, keep things a little more, <laughs> have the gameplay be a little more abstract, not the storytelling. Because <laughs> we were just talking about how abstract I already am. But like, I want the gameplay <laughs> to be abstract um, so I can hopefully have some more freedom to not limit myself so much. I want things to be a lot more freeform. Um, and before I had, with Pillar, I had a pretty extensive, like, list of notes of all these things I wanted to touch on, like, thematically. This time, I, my goal is to, um, literally make the game like I make music, which is literally not have any plans, just walk in and, like, express. That's what I'm trying to do with this game. Not have any plans at all, just kind of go in and design similar to how I make music. So, so talk to me about the, the challenge of making people feel anything with a game. I mean, cause I, 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 there, there are some games where it's a little bit easier just based on their, you know, the setting, but trying to do something as nuanced as personality and to kind of influence people's feelings towards something. What's that like trying to, you know, it's, a, it's, again, it's a lot easier for a call of duty. If I put a bunch of bad guys in there and have them, you know, blow yeah. up at school, those guys are bad. They need to be shot in the face. You know, yeah. I'm, I am now angry. But, you know, to try and do it more subtly, what's that like to try to, you know, it's in a non-traditional art, quote-unquote, like games? Yeah. Um, it's it's hard to verbalize, like, how I go about that. Um, well, because, like, yeah. it is it is pretty abstract. And, like, I, I know, you know, people are probably like, oh, he's pretentious. He doesn't even know what he's doing or whatever. But really, like, I, you really do kind of, yeah, like, you sound it. You know, you really yeah. keep it off that way here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, you, you you really do, or at least how I do it, I really do, like, feel it out kind of, similar to how I make songs. And I actually find that music, like, starting off as a musician has really influenced what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like I actually gave a uh, Sententia postmortem where I, I talked about this. But, like, there's a lot of – I listen to a lot of experimental music, like uh, John Cage. He was the guy who said even the silence is sound, and, you know, all sound is music. Yeah. And, um, you know, you limit yourself in this way, but I, I, I do believe that, like, every sound triggers some type of, like, memory. Um, like, for example, like, I grew up making stuff next to right next to an air conditioner. So whenever I hear an air conditioner, I kind of, like, have these fond memories of um, working on things and so on um, as a child. And I feel like gameplay can kind of do things like that, too. Uh, when you start to add in all these elements, you kind of click into these certain scenarios that trigger something, um, similar to how it feels to solve a puzzle, kind of. Okay. Um, and I feel like that triggers certain feelings. And I feel like that's the best way I can explain, like, the whole gameplay feeling thing, at least from the perspective I'm doing it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think um, there, there's different ways to do it, I'm sure. So, so as, a, as a musician... Because you started out as a musician, like you said. Yeah. Is it harder to go from being able to just play to then trying to compose? 
because I've never made that, you know, I, I'm, I'm a musician as well, but I've never tried to just, I mean, when I was a kid, I think I tried to write something not really seriously, but to say, I'm going to compose music now that does X. Is that, was that just a natural step for you? Or was that, man, I really need to figure out theory and do all the rest of this. So tell me a little bit about what that was like. Um, so I actually really struggle with, um, forcing myself to have a certain sound or mood. I'm not a very good musician in that way. Um, like if you, if you like hired me to compose music for your detective game, like if I wasn't feeling it, like in the mood to do like jazzy noir music or whatever, right. it wouldn't come out too good. <laughs> so I, like I'm not the best musician in that way, but see, like I feel like I benefit because like one of the uh, feature points I've said about Pillar is that I compose the music hand in hand with the game design. Right. And, and like what I mean by that is like I never set out to say, okay, you know, the game's about this, um, so the music needs to sound like this. I just knew, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the music actually inspired the design in some points, and the design actually inspired the music. It, it was like a back and forth process. Um, there's actually certain le parts of uh, the game, certain levels and sections that I entirely came up with because of how the music was feeling. Um, and I just naturally kind of made the music, right? So, like, really my entire, like, work process is very, like, stream of consciousness based. Um, and that's probably not how a traditional composer works. <laughs> so I don't know what to say there. But that's just kind of how, I mean, I'm lucky because I do all of it. That I can just kind of start working and it just fits because I know what I'm going for. So, so when you're working stream of consciousness like that, how do you know when you're done? Uh, not in just in terms of just you personally, do you find yourself saying just one more piece of code, just one more thing, five more minutes, or do you just tell yourself finish the damn thing and publish it? How, <laughs> how, how do you self-edit? Are, are you talking about uh, the music or just like the whole thing in general? Both. Both. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, music's a little bit easier because that kind of has a, a flow to it, you know. Yeah. Um, I would think, true. but yeah, no, it, it, you're right. It does have a flow. Yeah. The music was easier. I kind of knew when the music was done, um, because it just felt right to me. Yeah. Like, um, if that makes sense, but the game was a lot harder. Um, because I kept, I kept seeing bugs and I kept play testing it with people and they would say things that really made me question my design. And then it's like, well, are they right, or are they just not seeing a certain thing, or am I wrong? Or you know, it was it was a, it was a lot of questioning myself this time around, more mm -hmm. so than I had in the past. And to be honest, like I I probably drew the line just because I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> to be honest, like <laughs> uh, I had like I wrote an article about this um, last year, but I like I went through a lot of burnout and uh, mental problems because I literally I would work on the game for like twelve hours. Right. Never leave the house, never, and I just constantly, like, questioning myself, and I just kind of, towards the end, it's like, you know, I, somebody, um, his name's Casey Muratori, and he actually uh, came up with the idea for Braid, he's Jonathan Blow's friend, mm -hmm. uh, he came up with the, the rewinding mechanic idea, he actually played tested the game, and he, like, had a huge list of things, I, I, I responded to some of his feedback, but I was like, man, I, I just, I worked on this game for so long, and he told me, uh, sometimes it's a better idea, you know, to say that you did as good as you could with the knowledge you had at the time and call it done. And uh, I just kind of had to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, I honestly feel like there's nothing I would change about Pillar at the time. I honestly feel like I did the best I could, um, but I still think I have a long ways to go. Um, I already see stuff that I'd like to do different and so on, but I just kind of had reached my breaking point, I think, working on it. And uh, keeping that in mind, I'm hoping this next game is going to be a shorter development cycle. Right. Um, I, I think that's better for my position to try and release shorter games like that. So, so my my last question for you. So you're you're 22 now. We said right. Yeah. Yep. All right. So you can take a trip back to 17 year old you working on Honor and Vengeance. <laughs> what what advice would you give yourself, or or what pitfalls do you think you would try to avoid? And uh, the the follow up to that is, what still you know does it mean to be a Michael arts game? What is the, what is the epitome? What is the ideal game you would release? I think I would tell myself that programming isn't design. <laughs> that's, that's the first thing I'd say. Um, because honestly, I truly believe that I was designing games back then when really I feel like I was just learning programming 
with some of my other, earlier stuff, and I didn't uh-huh. understand that those were two different fields. And and to be honest, like I feel like a programmer should be a designer because I feel like if you know the system of what can be done, that's very beneficial to designing the game, right? Like if you know kind of the inner workings. But uh, so to be a Michael Arts game, um, really at this point, I just want to make something that people look back at and say, wow, you know, they, it's something that you can have a discussion about afterwards. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Something that can uh, inspires conversation and hopefully uh, makes people think about things in real life a little differently or be something that they can relate to in real life in some way. So. Well, it sounds good. Uh, Michael, I, I, you know I wish you nothing but continued success. <laughs> um, hopefully it won't be three years between our next conversation <laughs> this time. Uh, yeah, so. hopefully not. <laughs> always i mean always great to have you on and, uh, and again you're welcome back at any point so best of luck to you and you know keep doing what you're doing because there aren't enough voices like that that are different so you know keep on keeping on as it were yeah thanks so much man it was really great to be back because uh like i was thinking i feel like your interviews have kind of chronicled my career and uh that's really important to me to uh, be able to look back at that so i appreciate you having me back on well i appreciate having the opportunity so All right, Michael. Well, again, great to talk to you, and we should do it again sooner. So thank you again so much. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Take care.